artificial equilibrium. Uh, next week will be the last one. Uh, the semester ends this week at Harvard, and uh, next week we have the last colloquium. The week after next, so next week is the 5th of December on Tuesday. The week after is the 12th of December. Um, there will be a, a special colloquium on, a, on the neutral star neutral star merger given by uh, the LIGO event, given by Ingo Berger. Uh, and shortly afterwards, we will have a party, a winter party, holiday party, uh, from 3 to 4, uh, taking place here. So that will be in two weeks, and everyone is invited. What I wanted to ask is if any of the postdocs uh, has musical talents. Any, anyone that knows how to play an instrument is there? No? Just, just the keyboard? Why are you asking this? <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to admit to it until you tell them what. Would be an opportunity to perform if you if you could have those skills. So apparently nobody has. What's the reveal? Let me know privately if you don't have. The last thing I wanted to mention is this story that just came about. Has nothing to do with black holes, but it's interesting. Um, it's uh, there is an intruder to the solar system that came from outside the solar system. We never had an object pass through the solar system with positive energy. In other words, not bound to the sun. Uh, and this is the first one. It has a name, 2017 U uh, U1, and it was discovered by the Pan Stars uh, survey. And you can see its orbit. It already passed uh, by the Earth. It has roughly a size of uh, 800 meters in length and uh, estimated to be um, needle-shaped, so it has uh, only 80 meters in diameter. Very strange shape, so let me show you. Uh, there was an article about it in today's New York Times uh, in the science section, by, uh, so this is the article, and uh, this is the artist's illustration of how it should look like. To me, it looks like a spaceship. Uh, uh, so we don't know what it is. Uh, one simple way to figure out if it's uh, emitting any artificial light is to monitor how it fades away as it moves away from us. If it reflects uh, sunlight, uh, the amount of sunlight intercepted by the object falls off as one over distance squared, distance from the sun. And then uh, there is another factor of one over distance squared for the plaques that we receive from it. So altogether it goes like one over distance to the four. Um, while if it emits its own light, it would fade away as one over distance squared. So we can easily tell the difference by analyzing the data of, of how faint it gets as it moves away, whether it emits any artificial light. Uh, but at any event, it shows very large variations in its light, and that's how people came up with this large aspect ratio of factor of 10. This is very unusual to have a piece of rock that is 10 times longer than it is wide. Uh, and that's a puzzle. Uh, but that they, it changes uh, its reflectivity by a lot, uh, mm -hmm. and people think that it simply tumbles and it has this very elongated shape. We haven't taken an image of it. This is just an artist's illustration. Where is it now? So now it's uh, on its way towards uh, the orbit of Jupiter. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's getting fainter and fainter. And when is the closest approach? Is it was already. Right. Uh, you can see again. Do they know that? It has this irregular cross section. No, we haven't. We don't, we haven't taken an image of it. It was right. detected. So all we we know it's uh, we know the light curve. Basically, right. it has uh, a light curve that dims very deeply uh, and then shows up again. So that's how people come with the aspect ratio. Right. However, if the albedo, for example, changes a lot, the reflectivity right. of the surface that could also account for large variations yeah. as it comes. worse. Yeah. Symmetrical. <coughs> we don't know. Around the axis, then you would think tumbling wouldn't even make a big difference. Right. So we don't know. Um, I mean, uh, it, uh, uh, we didn't break the record in terms of the number of publications on a single uh, source uh, <laughs> compared to the LIGO event. In the LIGO event, there were more than 50 papers on the same day. Uh, on this, on this uh, object, there are eight papers over the past month. So. It's not as popular, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, could be as uh, significant depending on, on its nature. How so do I just we know it's from outside source? Uh, the energy, you would take the kinetic energy, add to it the gravitational binding energy. If it were coming from within the solar system, the total energy is ne would be negative. Uh, 
If the total energy is positive, you can measure the, the kinetic energy by seeing it moving on the sky. So you can tell the orbit, and you can tell that the energy is, is positive in this one. That's quite unusual. The first time that we detected such an object, and I actually wrote a paper uh, six years ago predicting how many such objects would exist, and the prediction was off by a few orders of magnitude. So these objects apparently are much more common than previously thought. So they fill up the galaxy, they move around. So this object itself visited about 20,000 uh, stars, according to the uh, New York Times article today, um, in its lifetime. Over a few billion years, it just went through 20,000 stellar systems. Um, and potentially, it could bring life if it has life on it. It could bring life if it collides with a planet. Or, uh, because we know that rocks brought life. It could potentially bring life from the one planet to another. We had Martian rocks found on Earth. Anyway, just uh, an important, uh, interesting development in, in astronomy that we don't often hear about. And now to the talks of the day for us. Well, it's a, a great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Carl Hafer to the Black Hole Initiative and the Black Hole Initiative Colloquium Series. Professor Hafer is a philosopher at the University of Barcelona who works in a wide variety of areas in the philosophy and history of physics and metaphysics and, and the philosophy of science. He's a PhD in philosophy from Stanford University. And uh, we had the privilege yesterday of, of hearing some of his thoughts on philosophical aspects of space time and the relationship to singularities and black holes. And uh, I'm glad to say that privilege will continue today as he tells us about uh, what it is that we should believe about black holes. Thanks. So I feel like the privilege is mine. It's really great to be here. Um, so I want to thank Peter and the other um, directors of, of the initiative for inviting me. Um, so this is going to be different, I understand, from most of the talks that you've had so far in, this, in the colloquium. Uh, it's going to be um, a talk about uh, a philosophy issue, philosophy of science issue known as scientific realism versus anti-realism. Um, as Peter mentioned yesterday in our session, it's it's centuries old issue. Um, basically, is the question that philosophers of science want to uh, answer which is when and why should we believe in the truth, or the approximate truth, of the contents of our best science? Um, when those contents uh, concern facts and entities that are not observable, can't be sort of directly confirmed by the senses or simple experiments. And um, what I'll be doing today is defending a, a scientific realist stance, but it's going to be one that urges caution concerning um, the content of our fundamental physical theories but at the same time, uh, says we can be confident in the knowledge of the existence of a lot of uh, entities that are posited in, in our best uh, physical theories, and, and especially black holes. But we'll get there uh, soon. So what is this issue that philosophers have wrestled with about scientific realism and anti-realism? Um, well, I won't have time to go into a lot of depth about the issue and the various positions that have been taken. So this is going to be a whirlwind tour. Um, for the next couple of slides. Um, basically, after many decades of not being a big issue in the 70s, uh, when philosophy of science sort of liberated itself from the heritage of positivism and logical empiricism, um, then there was a kind of an explosion of people s stepping forward and saying, you know, I think that um, our best science should be just taken as true, not merely uh, useful and predictive. And um, uh, so the idea is that uh, we could believe contents of our best scientific theories are true or approximately true. Um, even more popular was the claim that we should believe in the existence of the unobservable entities and processes postulated by our most successful uh, theories, including physics. And one of the early um, statements that was very influential um, was by Hilary Putnam saying realism, and he means scientific realism, is the only philosophy that does not make the success of science a miracle. So this is a slogan that has uh, really resonated throughout the years, but it wasn't uh, long at all before the contrary camp of philosophy uh, uh, struck back, anti-realism uh, inspired by especially uh, looking seriously at the history of science um, 
and finding that uh, all sorts of past uh, theories seemed to be successful at the time. Uh, 19th century electromagnetism, to some extent the phlogiston theory of chemistry, um, Newton's theory of gravity, they all seem to be successful theories. They're now all completely overthrown. The basic ontology, the entities that they posited, we don't believe they exist. And so there was this phrase coined the pessimistic induction or meta-induction. We should just look at the history of all these successful theories that get overthrown and just kind of assume by naive induction the same is going to happen to our current fears. Um, so that was an influential perspective uh, fighting back. Even more important from my perspective, um, the debate between scientific realism and anti-realism has tended to very often focus primarily on physics theories. And uh, for better or worse, fundamental physics today is unbelievable. <laughs> I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, <laughs> so you can take it both ways. <laughs> Unbelievably hard. Um, and so the anti-realists' uh, position says we should withhold belief from the unobservable stuff in our current science, despite the predictive successes uh, that we see all over the place in science. Um, just be agnostic about these things. And um, uh, so myself. Uh, I was first reading about these things in the early 80s, and, um, and I didn't take a stand. I didn't feel like I had to take a stand. So what would happen is I would read something by a scientific realist and think, yeah, well, that sounds right. I agree with that. And then I would read some history of science and think, oh, gosh, uh, science is always uh, a mess. And, and so I could just fluctuate back and forth. But recently, I've come to take a, a principled stand, and, and I'll say a few words about the way I think about this nowadays. But first, uh, I want to make a remark about um, choice. Because these, the two stances of scientific realism and anti-realism that I would just, was just laying out are basically, the way I think of them, are statements about what you should believe, what we should take ourselves to have good reasons to believe. Um, but at the same time, I've become convinced over the years that um, with exactly the same evidence, the same empirical input, two people can come to different conclusions and neither one of them be irrational. So there has to be realm for, for choice and flexibility in what reason demands that we believe <coughs> or not believe. So the scientific realist says we have more than sufficient reasons now to believe in a whole bunch of stuff. The anti-realist takes the perspective we have less than sufficient reason to believe in that same stuff. Okay. So a way to think about the disagreement is as a disagreement about what is now beyond reasonable doubt. What have we established uh, to, to an extent that it just isn't reasonable? It's not within that realm of where two reasonable people can disagree anymore. Can, can I ask a quick, quick, quick question? What do you mean by believe? And that's a good question. So there's two things. There's a binary on-off notion of belief that we use a lot in daily life. Um, so I believe I'm giving a talk, and I believe this is a bottle of water. Nothing else to say. And then there's a the subjective degree of confidence that one has, which is a, is a, a variable thing between zero and one in probabilistic terms. And both of those ideas can be brought to bear in this debate, and you can think of realists as having an extraordinarily high subjective uh, degree of confidence in this stuff, and the anti-realists as having a much lower. But did that answer the question you were getting at? Not, not really, but I'll wait, because I'm sure that there's more to come. OK. Um, but here's the remark I, I really wanted to make. Um, when not too much is at stake, uh, I think that realists can say it's OK to be an anti-realist, and vice versa. Um, we can be flexible about these kind of things. Um, the demands of reason, so to speak. Like, what you have to do in order to be a rational uh, agent with the kind of evidence that we have has flexibility. But um, sometimes too much is at stake to let unreasonable visions of what is a reasonable doubt govern. Uh, and this is actually relevant to the scientific realism issue. For example, um, a, a big issue right now is whether it's OK for members of the public to disbelieve in the virus theory of illnesses and hence, um, not 
don't vaccinate their children. Or even if they do believe in the virus theory, but not believe all the scientific evidence about the safety of vaccines. Um, and global warming, climate change, uh, whose causal mechanisms are certainly unobservable, and we're trying to infer exactly what's going on using a lot of theory. Um, what I want to say is, uh, when the stakes get very high, then it really matters where you position yourself on that spectrum between zero and one in your confidence. And taking, when those stakes are low, it matters a lot less where you place yourself. But when the stakes are high, then disbelieving in certain parts of con contemporary science, I think, is not a reasonable thing, and it's actually dangerous. So it's dangerous, I think, for philosophers to stand up and, and say in public or in testimony to Congress uh, things like a general statement of anti-realism that's going to apply to, to these things. So, um, all right. So my recent sort of fixation on being a scientific realist comes out of some lessons that I, I learned over the years. The first lesson is that scientific realism would be a much stronger doctrine, uh, more defensible, if it didn't try to defend realism concerning modern fundamental physical theories, by which I basically mean quantum, th quantum theories uh, and general relativity. Second lesson, um, really the core intuition behind realism, what keeps uh, driving it in, in people's work and in their minds, is a feeling that it's absolutely crazy not to believe in viruses, in DNA, atoms and molecules, tectonic plates, and, and many of the things we say about them. Of course, we all we could have little bits of our, our beliefs about them be wrong, but not wholesale just falsity. And the third lesson um, is that if we focus on the stuff that's now crazy to doubt, then we can get a version of scientific realism which is defensible and worthy of the name, even after we bracket off fundamental physics theories. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about now. Um, what do I mean when I say leave fundamental physics out of scientific realism? Well, I have, I'll just list a few motivations. I can't go into any detail. Um, the quantum theories remain problematic uh, in part. For many philosophers, there's still this issue of the measurement problem in quantum theory, which there are ways of resolving it, but uh, are not uniformly accepted across even the physics community, much less among philosophers. Um, perhaps even more importantly, at the fundamental level in, in both quantum and other areas, we tend to get multiple versions of a theory with apparently different ontological pictures and sometimes even different equations, which turn out to be empirically, adequate, empirically equivalent. They make the same predictions for all the experiments we can do so far. That kind of underdetermination um, is, is a reason to be withholding, or at least uh, somewhat agnostic. And of course, quantum theories and general relativity seem to be incompatible, and we're looking for a way of squaring these, these two frameworks. So I don't think it's an exaggeration to say almost everybody, whether in philosophy or, or, or science, expects major future revolutions to occur, at least about gravity theory, and maybe also uh, in regard to quantum theories. And if you're expecting that, then of course you, you're bracketing the truth in the absolute, full across the board sense of these theories. Now, there's a sense of course in which I want to say our current quantum theories are true and we'll never get rid of them. What do I mean by that? They're absolutely fantastic at making predictions and we know how to do that. And we know how to treat various systems using the theories and we can always do that. We'll always be able to do that in the future. But it seems like a possibility that we might just come on, oh, into having a different theory in the future that says radically different things about that fundamental ontology. What's the dimensionality of the space that the fundamental entities are set in? And things like that. When it comes to general relativity, Einstein himself was uh, at times, in a sense, a, a skeptic in the, in the way I'm talking about. Is that the same thing as just saying that we expect small corrections to all our theories? No, no. It's, it's it's saying that when someone asks you what what, what really exists uh, fundamentally and what's it like, you may tell a completely different story fifty years from now than what you're telling now. That's the idea. So something like the corresponding principle still holds, right? Still holds. Yes. But I mean, I would say Newton's theory was completely correct. 
Um, so, in, in the sense in which I'm talking about truth and correctness, if you say that Newton's theory is completely correct, then you believe that there's absolute space that's Euclidean and infinite in all directions and so forth. Now, I know you don't mean that. So, right. what you mean is that, in, in philosopher speak, Newton's theory is empirically adequate up to a certain uh, large degree of, of exactitude for a, lot, a wide range of velocities and energies and so forth. That is true, but that's all at the observable level. But that's not we, what's at, that's not what uh, is an issue between the realist and the anti-realist. Okay, but physicists might never hope for more than that. Okay. Yeah. I, I, well, when we were talking, I, I actually said the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> because if you think about Einstein, the way I mean, there are physicists that care about uh, just shut up and calculate. And there are physicists that care about the substance behind it. And Einstein really cared about the meaning of what, what he, you know, so that there are. I said, my, some physicists. Yeah, some yeah. Physicists, right. <laughs> I think that's exactly And more right. and more of them. And, and Einstein's, I think, is, is kind of old fashioned. I mean, if you. Anyway. Einstein was an old fashioned realist, I, yeah. in some senses. Yeah, but so, doesn't mean that he's not right. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's a quote from 1936. Um, it's, a, it's well known in, in, in my community. So, General relativity is sufficient, as far as we know, for the representation of the observed facts of celestial mechanics. That's all the observable. So, but it is similar to a building, one with, wing of which is made of fine marble, the left part of the equation, meaning the metric tensor and the Einstein tensor you generate out of that. The other wing of which is built of low-grade wood. That's the right side of the equation, the, the energy mass of the metric tensor. The phenomenological representation of matter is, in fact, only a crude substitute, substitute for a representation which would do justice to all known properties of matter. So Einstein here is saying, this is not a, a true fundamental theory. But of course, at that time, Einstein was convinced that, that uh, the right way of think, uh, getting rid of the right side of the equation would be to basically replace it with a version of the left side of the equation. Um, in other words, reduce uh, matter to some sort of uh, configuration of, of a single fundamental field. We don't think that's possible now. And so, in a sense, the perspective now might be that also the left side of the equation is low-grade wood, which is not meant to be an insult to the, to the theory of <laughs> But fortunately, there's much more to science than fundamental physics, and a lot of science is simply known to be true. Yeah. Um, you kept track of when I started, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, there's times when doubting simply becomes crazy. So if you think about our best uh, other theories in science, and geology and parts of biology, chemistry, material science, and all these things, these also prompt realist sentiments. And the facts that we discover in these fields are typically known by multiple routes, uh, and the branches of knowledge interconnect in very complex ways. Uh, Quine talked about this as a, as a web of beliefs, but I would say knowledge in this case. And, and that, when that situation arises, we have multiple epistemic handles, that's a, a term I'm, I'm working on developing, on most of the core contents of these areas of science. Given the interdependence and the interconnectedness of all these parts of science, if you want to think that some core bit of it is seriously wrong, is false, in the way that phlogiston theory was false, um, that requires supposing chain reaction of revisions in all sorts of other things that we think and that are held as true by current science. And that chain reaction propagates. So here's the core of my, my version of scientific realism. So on this point, so you would say that quantum mechanics has not reached that level? It's kind of confirmed at the calculation level. A calculation, prediction, observations, experiment. We agree at so many levels. Isn't that a lot of interconnections? It's not the same kind of interconnection. It's, okay. a, very good, it's a very good question. Um, basically, once you see, I'll, I'll use the example that philosophers like to use um, uh, ordinary non relativistic quantum mechanics and, and volume mechanics, and you learn them both, and you see why they, they make the same predictions for what happens in the laboratory. So this gives you an example of how, well, I mean, not that I think Bowman and the mechanics could be true, but just bracket that skepticism for a moment. You, 
we've got um, one story about what atoms are and 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 hence what molecules are and viruses and so on. But it's all at the, at the fundamental level. And you've got a completely different story. But because they have the same empirical upshot, um, they don't interconnect with these things in the same way that, that these other higher sciences interconnect with each other. It's different. You could sort of you can change your mind about that substrate, but because once it filters up to the level where it matters for chemistry um, and optics and things like that, it's all going to do the same stuff. It's not the same situation. So the idea is for that these other parts of science, the only way you can be a skeptic about some big um, important piece of it is to suppose modifying everything in a way that it really can only be done by what we call radical skeptical scenarios uh, in philosophy. You'll end up basically uh, forced to say, well, we're all being deceived by, by some evil deceiver, or we're all basically uh, brains in a vat, uh, or simulations on a computer, uh, like the matrix, or something like that. There's no other way you can really seriously conceive to work it out. And we can and should dismiss this kind of uh, uh, skeptical scenario. It's not reasonable that way. So I, I won't have time to talk more about it for the stem and candles. It's too bad. Um, but let me go forward. This is kind of what I mean. Suppose you wanted to doubt the existence of atoms in the sense that that was basically established in 1905 or whatever. So if there's no atoms, you have to rework. Uh, there's no molecules. By extension, you have to rework chemistry. There's no statistical mechanics for gases. You have to rework that. So and so and so forth. It's just going to explode into a bunch of changes that you really don't have any way of uh, seriously conceiving you can do. So my form of realism, um, it's called, I don't have a good name for it yet, and so today it's just papers, scientific realism. <laughs> we have good reason to believe in the truth of those parts of current science which are such that we cannot imagine a scenario in which they're seriously false without that scenario being essentially a radical skeptical scenario. Um, and this, I think, captures the correct core intuition that Putnam's uh, quote um, was, was after before. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go quickly now so I have time to talk about uh, a little bit of physics. As I said, I want to exclude fundamental physics uh, from the scope of scientific realism, and also basically everything from pre 20th century science, with maybe a few isolated exceptions. Um, so what we should believe, according to this doctrine, is basically what scientists tell us can't be wrong at this point, it's already beyond any reasonable doubt. So, electrons. Here I tried to give a, a kind of a, a cautious statement about the existence of electrons and that we know certain properties about them. That, that's inside uh, my other favorite example. Uh, we know that viruses exist and we know certain things about them, for sure. Um, it's that kind of thing. These are parts of the content of our most successful sciences, and we have to we have to word these things carefully. But once we do that, there's no question. Okay, so is it always entities that fall into this realism? Uh, this the camp no. of interconnect. It could be laws. It could be laws. Um, Yes, it could be laws, especially at the level of chemistry, for example. And here, what, what I've got in here are the positing of entities, but also some, uh, some facts about them. So it's laws, <coughs> facts, and entities. So uh, yes, uh, electrons are, are entities from fundamental physical theory, in a sense. But there's a kind of 20th century intro physics that I'm also going to include in the scope of what's now beyond any reasonable doubt. So, and no imaginable future revolution, including finding the right quantum theory of gravity, is really going to change that intro physics stuff. Okay. So let's go um, and think about the purpose of today's talk, which is to say, okay, I think that all fundamental physical theory is up for grabs, most of it perhaps, but there are many um, fundamental low-level entities that we can already say are here to stay. So I mentioned electrons, and I'll, I'll throw in protons and neutrons for free, positrons, antiprotons, and antineutrons. 
Uh, once you get to quarks, muons, neutrinos, I think that we have fewer epistemic handles. It's a little more shaky, but I probably would talk to these guys too. I'm not ready to put the Higgs boson into that camp of what's beyond a reasonable doubt. And let's talk about black holes. So, but first, to compare with the Higgs boson, we have a theoretical handle on the, on the Higgs boson because it plays a useful role in the standard model. But it's not, unlike protons, it's not a component of ordinary matter. So it's not like we, we ascend and say, see that thing over there? It's, it's largely made of Higgs. Okay? We don't have that kind of handle on it. Um, so, and it has this role as the mass giver, mass giver to particles, something like that. But who knows if that might be overthrown or modified seriously in future physics. And we have exactly one experimental handle on it so far, which is the observations at CERN. So rejecting or reinterpreting uh, about the Higgs is conceivable, it seems to me. And we have to keep an open mind about that. Okay. <clears throat> There's two sort of ways that, that we might change our mind. We could say, well, the particle announced in 2012 it remains in the ontology, but loses its interpretation as the Higgs boson. Um, maybe we eliminate the theoretical role that the Higgs was supposed to play. And then people say, the Higgs boson turned out not to exist. Okay. A different way <clears throat> that things might go is that um, the particle remains in the ontology and we still call it the Higgs boson. But we lose the connection to the Higgs mechanism that gets stripped away from it. And then people say, the Higgs boson turned out not to play a role in explaining the masses of particles. This is, these are basically two linguistic choices that people might make. On either of these, I would say, in the sense that we're interested in as for the realism debate, that's changing our mind about the Higgs. Okay? So finally, I'll get the black holes with a few minutes, but I don't have that much to say about black holes. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> I think, and that's been confirmed in conversations with people since I've uh, come here, People expect there are big discoveries yet to come. The full theory is not known, but we know they exist. Okay. The black holes <coughs> exist, this is beyond doubt. But what is the they? Um, that has to be said with a little bit of care. Um, at the very least, um, a physicist I know in Barcelona said, well, at the very least, we can be sure that black hole imposters exist. By which he means something like, dark, super dense objects beyond the density of neutron stars. Um, so we might be wrong about certain things, but those guys definitely exist. They're formed in large stellar collapses and other events. Um, we know some places where they're hiding. <coughs> um, and as with the status of electrons in 1905, we have too many handles on black holes for it to be really conceivable that there's 50 years in the future, we'll just say, oops, we were totally wrong. Black holes don't exist in any sense. That's not going to happen. The LIGO events are impossible. Uh, right, a, a new observational handle in the LIGO events. Yes, well, that's one of several. We, uh, we, o we also know they exist as solutions of some equations, right? Sure, well, uh, but that's, that's a mathematical existence, yeah. Well, you, you didn't preface it by, you said exist. So, um, mathematical existence is existence. So, so here, here, here's, um, I forget uh, Roger Blanford saying that black holes uh, used to be in the realm of the speculative, but for 30 or 40 years it's been abundantly clear that they're very common in the universe, beyond all reasonable doubt, uh, that my emphasis, there's a massive black hole at the center of most normal galaxies, including them. Um, he says 30 or 40 years, I think that might be a little generous, but for sure, 1916, the solution existed, and black holes existed in that, in that sense, but we couldn't be sure that they really exist at that time. That's all I want to say. Actually, Einstein wrote the paper in 1939, arguing that they don't exist. And now, just to end, uh, what we don't know about black holes, um, which is a lot. <clears throat> uh, general relativity correctly describes 
the geometry at the event horizon at, and I don't mean, I mean really at. Um, so, uh, my colleague in Barcelona said, I, I, I was asking him this question, like, what do you think is absolutely beyond a reasonable doubt now about black holes? And he said, that general relativity describes out to, say, twice the short field radius, closer. the structure of space-time. Much closer, though. And maybe much closer. closer. But he, didn't, he wasn't willing to go all the way to touch any other things. Um, we don't know that Hawking radiation for sure exists and is formed. If it exists, we don't know whether it's purely thermal or, or correlated with the interior. We don't know firewall anything. Which is not to say that these are bad hypotheses. What I mean is, these are still controversial. These are still open to reasonable doubt. We don't know there's a curvature singularity at the center of black holes. We also don't know that there's not one. Okay. And we, we don't know that string theory adequately describes black holes. We don't know that it doesn't. Uh, and we don't know whether holography is going to tell us something uh, deep about uh, black holes in our, in our world. Um, no, because even if you even if you take it as established that black holes, that holography teaches us about black holes in anti sitter space times, we might still <coughs> wonder about our space time. So this is a list of all the things we, we don't know. Um, can I have another minute to wrap up? All of what I just said, you might take as um, what members of the public, what philosophers, according to my doctrine, should believe. But remember, I talked about the flexibility of, of uh, and, and the, the flexibility of what are the, the bounds of reason. In particular, I think that physicists uh, can, if they want, believe a lot more about black holes. What, what should physicists believe? I think the answer is most of the time, whatever they see as supported by good evidence and good reasoning. Okay. So when I when I'm talking with someone who is absolutely completely convinced that string theory is the right theory of black holes, and that's the end of the story, that's already been established. That's okay. I, when they put on that hat, I do think, then if they're you know, giving testimony in Congress or talking to journalists, they might want to take that hat off a little bit uh, and put on a slightly more skeptical hat. So there's this way of doing Western science, um, which involves open-mindedness, fairness, and caution, but also competition and advocacy and persuasion. And for these aspects of the way we do science, a strong conviction in something which maybe occasionally we back off from can be useful and, and desirable. <clears throat> so I, I definitely want to say it's okay for physicists to be more realist uh, than I am about a lot of these issues. We're so lucky because the stakes about what to believe about black holes are not high in the way that the stakes are high about vaccines and global warming. Unless you're an expert black hole. Unless you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we should be happy about that. Um, <clears throat> Concluding, I want to say scientific realism is right, properly understood. Um, large swaths of contemporary science can be described as known to be true or approximately true. Um, and that includes the existence of black holes and, and, and some things that we know about them. Um, uh, most of our detailed uh, theories about black hole structure and behavior is open to reasonable skeptical doubt. And that's part of what makes this so exciting. <coughs> Thanks. say to the climate change deniers, <coughs> or anthropomorphic climate change deniers? So one thing I would say is follow the money. When you look at where the people who are putting themselves forth as experts mm -hmm. and generating the appearance of doubt, look where they're funded from. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, I think Peter already raised this point. Looking at all of your examples, we can believe things, objects, particles, black holes, or whatever. It's when you come to the underlying concepts that you say we got to be more cautious because there may be a different construct in the foundation that might give the same predictions and may give you the same results, but it's a new picture altogether. Yeah. So this, as I understand, is kind of the concept, I mean, the, 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 the distinction you're making. But this reminded me of, uh, one quote, I read it in Feynman, but I think he attributed it to Einstein, who said, you know, in a, in a couple of hundred years, 
probably almost any of our physics is going to look completely different. And he was, at that time, talking about quantum mechanics yeah. and general <coughs> relativity. But he said statistical mechanics will survive mm -hmm. as a framework, as a concept of just you know counting states and looking at the most probably probable state. That is never going to go out of fashion. So would that be then a theory that we should believe, or is that also going to be in your I, I would also, skeptical I, box? That's a good example of something that I wasn't. I, Peter was asking, do you put any theory and laws yeah. in your box of what's <coughs> in, and that would be a good case. Yes. So. It doesn't matter what we, whether we believe in strings or causal oh, sets or whatever the heck it is at the bottom level. Still, statistical mechanics something. is going to talk about what happens with gases and boxes. Right. Okay. So w when I asked about belief before, I, I guess what I was trying to get at is uh, realism or anti-realism. It, it uh, I'm, I'm trying to find out what its impact is. And as an, as an example, if it guides future experiments in a productive way. That would be an example of taking one stance over another. So is there, are there predictions based on realism or anti-realism on the optimal approach to questioning where we are now and planning for future experiments? Uh, not from the, 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 the philosophical doctrine I was trying to lay out it doesn't uh, give really advice about that except maybe at a mundane level, um, if you're making decisions about how to allocate research funding, uh, how to direct graduate students um, in theoretical physics, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, that's about it, I, 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 as far as I can think right now. But do, do my, do, <coughs> if you have the kind of anti-realism where you think our sole aim in producing improved physical theories is to improve our predictive ability, then you might well decide, you know, at the, the kinds of predictions we're making when we do, say, ex experiments at CERN, those are good enough given how much it costs for us not to invest anymore. Like, if you really think all you want to do is improve your predictive ability, then the question, is it worth spending 30 billion euros to get a few more decimal points, is going to look different from if you, if you take a realist stance and you think our success at making those predictions shows us something about how the world works. Does that make sense? Like... Mm -hmm. you no, know, if you mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. there's some interesting truth about the fundamental physical structure of the world to be discovered, that might be worth spending money on. That's mm -hmm. not worth spending on mm -hmm. simply improving the accuracy of some prediction, just for its own sake. Yeah. Right. Well, but, like there's a new, but there's a nuanced version of that, right? You might, you might, even if you don't really care so much about those extra two digits, you might believe that the process of finding, of trying to find them leads you to learn more about whatever is coming next. More technology, more... You're climbing it because it's there, even if you... Yeah, but it, if it's just you're climbing it because it's there, there are lots of challenges we could set ourselves up. I personally don't think that the extra digit that we might get in the next accelerator is going to... is likely to tell us something fundamental about the origin of electro weak symmetry breaking. Yet I think it's worth doing because we can do it and we need to push down every avenue that we can and we may on the way just there may be a left turn when we go down <coughs> another few another uh, another few digits. It's good to live in the south yeah. yeah. So for our second speaker, we are very happy to have today Hernan Gonzalez. 
from the University of Vienna, in Technical University. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher, and before that he was a postdoc in the University of Brussels. He's an expert on synthetic symmetries, uh, flat space, and dynamics of space time. And today he will tell us about quantum dynamics of 2D gelatin reactivity. Thank you, Lara, for the introduction. It's a great honor to be here at the Blackpool Initiative. Today, I will start uh, present the dynamics at the boundary of space time in a two dimensional dilaton gravity model. This is highly related with models of described quantum black holes in two dimensions. This is a work in progress and in collaboration with Daniel Grumiller and Jakob Salzberg. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. First of all, I will start with a brief motivation based on the F by K model. Then I will discuss the model of gravity I will use during this talk, which is the Dilaton gravity model, and a specific Jackie Tyson model. In this model, it will be important to, to regularize the action principle, because I want to construct action principles for the boundary of the first time. So I need to have a regularized action principle, and also, it will be necessary to construct the initial action. I will show an example, and at the end I will present some conclusions. So, let me start by highlighting certain aspects of my talk. First of all, is the importance of infinite dimensional symmetries in the quantum description of gravity. So, for instance, the, the first equation, which is the Bekens and Hawking entropy, for a, for a black hole in general, relativity. In some in some cases, it's been due to the infinite dimensional symmetry, it's been possible to count the states given rise to that entropy. So it's one of the tests uh, of having infinite dimensional symmetries. The second one, it appears in the asymptotical asymptotically description of nat infinity in asymptotically flat space time. This is at null infinity. You, it was observed back in the 60s that there is an infinite dimensional group, the BMS group, that contains point carrier symmetry. And recently, it's been observed that this BMS group gives rise or allows you to understand properties of infrared gravity. Okay, so in that sense, it's been successful. Other important aspect is the idea of holography and holography in lower dimensions because in lower dimensions I have more control on the theory, so I can I'm able to make more predictions about what will happen, in, for instance, in the case of our quantum black hole. And in particularly, in particular, I will be interested in ADS theories in ADS two. So ADS two is a, it's spaces with negative cosmological constants. And this is like a drawing for the hyperbolic space. And the corresponding theories at the boundary of the space time, which in this case is a conformal field theory with uh, in one dimension. Okay? If I if I can choose this duality, in, in the case for instance, when I place a black hole in the in the bulk, and in this case I will there are some models that represent a conformal field theory at the boundary that has uh, certain properties that I will describe now. And this is the so-called SYK model, which is a model to, to study holographically quantum black holes in two dimensions. It was introduced by Subjet and Ye in, to, in 1993, improved by Kitar in 2015, and also uh, by Maldacena and Stanford in 2016. It's a quantum mechanical model. It's a model in one dimension that con consists of n fermions in presence of a random cap in J and at finite temperature beta. What is interesting is that at large n, so when I have many fermions and I'm, I'm go I, I go to, lower temp to low temperatures, the system develops conformal symmetry. Conformal symmetry, like I only have time, this, this is the Euclidean time, so that uh, goes to zero to theta. And this is a 
it has this infinite dimensional symmetry, which is a diffeomorphism on the circle, on the therm thermal circle. What happened is that this symmetry is spontaneously broken, in the sense that that the equations that describe, for instance, the correlation functions of the model possess conformal symmetry. But due to finite temperature effects, these correlation functions acquire a, a, term, a certain form. So then the, the symmetry gets broken. It's like the equations have a certain symmetry, but the solution of the so solution are not invariant in under the symmetry, but only under a subgroup. So I have this breaking from this infinite dimensional symmetry to this SL2R symmetry, which is small in this case. And this is also observed from the effective point of view, in, in the sense that in the large and limit, this model is controlled by a Schwarzschild action. This Schwarzschild action corresponds to a quantum mechanical system with a certain potential. This potential is here correspond to a charge and derivative is a quantity that's SL, SL to R invariant. So SL to R invariant, so if I change Q by this transformation, I don't change the charge and derivative, where A, B, C, and D correspond to a, a matrix with determinant one. So it's the SL to R transformation. So this action is not completely invariant under all the symmetry, not at the conformal symmetry, but only at the un under a subset of them. Okay? So the purpose of my talk is to extend, generalize, the large end limit behavior of the SYK model from a or gravitational perspective. So I want to construct, more precisely, I want to construct boundary action associated to those modes from a holographic uh, perspective. Here is the thing that in the large end limit, when I have many fermions, the system is, the, the quantum corrections are suppressed. So the system can be well described by classical gravity in two dimensions. But for that, I need to find a model, of, a consistent model of, of gravity in two dimensions. And one of them are the so-called two-dimensional dilaton gravity model. Okay, so let me start. Why, for instance, I cannot use uh, Einstein Hilbert action? Einstein Hilbert action in two dimensions, it's a topological invariant, so the integral of, of the curvature does not produce any dynamics. But if I multiply the Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian by a scalar field, X, the dilaton, I give dynamics to the system. However, this theory is topological, so it doesn't propagate bad degrees of freedom, local degrees of freedom, sorry. So it's a good model because it allows me to write everything entirely in the boundary of the spacetime. In the context of SYK model, this has been already used by Almieri and Polchinski in 2015, by Mandelsen and Stanford and Yang, and presently by Grumiller, Manis, Salzer, Van Carter and Van Levich. And the last uh, reference is the approach I want to follow in this talk. I will present the results in a reformulation of this theory, in a gauge formulation what, that I will describe now. First of all, I will consider a Euclidean theory, Euclidean at finite temperature. This means finite temperature. The topology, <coughs> also the space time I will consider have the topology of a disk. So here I have a, like a radial coordinate and, uh, and, the, and the temperature is identified. Sorry, the temperature, the Euclidean time is identified by data. Also, the, the fields, the metric for instance, will be represented by a non-abelian non, uh, non gauge field, A mu, and X is represented by a vector x. These ja are generators of, of a certain group that I will specify later. Okay, so let me go to the to the action that I will use. This action was constructed in the API by these two groups. 
uh, it's similar to, to, the, to the Achieve Fetchable model in the sense that it's a product between the, the dilaton and the curvature. There is an inner product here, this, this, thing, the, this bracket, that it's the invariant tensor of, of a certain group G. And it happens that if I use the group SL2R, I will recover the second order combination. And in this case, I would like to consider extension of that in the sense that one piece will be SL2R, but I will also have I will add another piece that will give me uh, the possibility to add matter to the system. Okay, so it's gravity plus certain some sort of matter. The system is invariant the field symmetries, and the field equations are the curvature vanishes, so the high value with respect to x vanishes by x is zero, and if and the Dilaton equation that uh, also arises from varying with respect to data. Okay, so what is important here is that the, the, variant observable, the gauge invariant observables of the theory. First of all, there is one non trivial cycle, the thermal cycle, and th you can try to study this, 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 this cycle by looking at the holonomies around it. This somehow gives me information about the, the geometry. In the sense that regularity of solutions imply that the holonomy should be one, not this, it should be a unit. And if I impose this condition, what I'm doing, in fact, physically, it's having a black hole at Hopkins temperature. So when I when I when the system does not have any any holonomies, what I'm doing is putting a black hole at the right temperature. Another function that uh, plays the role of the mass is the Casimir function. It's a quadratic combination of the dilaton. It's conserved in the sense that if I apply the time derivative and I use the equations of motion, this Casimir function is conserved. Okay, so let me say why these models are interesting. It's because, well, as I said before, the gauge theory formulation allowed me to introduce extensions to the pure check if that's the result. The dynamics of the boundary, I will show that it's de described by the, by the Casimir function. And what is more interesting is that the asymptotic symmetries get broken due to finite temperature effects. So this is, I want, I want to show you with this drawing. For instance, here I have the two coordinates, the, the set of this uh, Euclidean time tau and the coordinate rho, rho runs, runs from zero to infinity. At infinity, I have a certain profile for the field, which is described by a, a infinity and x infinity, let's say. And at the, in the old region, in the near horizon region, in principle, I might have conical singularities. So the holonomies are not the identity. So here I have a competition between two effects. For instance, I have a certain asymptotic description, and at the same time, I have effects associated to singularities in the in the near horizon region. But if I remove the singularity at the horizon, so I manage to have black holes at Hawking temperature. What I do also, I impose conditions on, on the gauge field that restrict my my gauge my gauge connection. So in that sense, the synthetic connection A infinity becomes a subset of them of those connections, which is consistent with the smoothness of, of the space of solutions. Okay, in that sense there is a break in the symmetry. All we can say it holographically. Okay. To to show this Features in a in an action principle. I need to start from the from the first order formulation that I just introduced to you. And it happens that the action is not extreme for the class of solutions considered here. So in fact, it is a it's not a real 
stream because I have this boundary term. So I have to regularize it. And in order to regularize it, I, at the boundary, I use an integrability condition that uh, comes from, from, from solving the equation for motion of infinity. And it's, and it's represented in terms of two variables. One, it's a one form at infinity, and another one is a group element that gives rise to the Sumerian Cartan form. These are two variables that are free to vary at infinity. Okay. So with this integrality condition, I, I get a well-defined action principle, which is uh, the, the, the first, the one I start with, plus this boundary term at infinity. And what is, inter what is interesting here is that if I impose the equations of motion, this term vanishes because it's proportional to the curvature that has to be zero. And, and I entirely describe my action principle that this term at the, at the boundary. So the term, the initial action is given by this, where f of tau is the function that I just told you and C is the Casimir function. So using the asymptotic input for A phi and the integrality condition, I, I can write the Casimir as a function of A infinity, F of tau, and U. One thing that I want to say here is that F, tau, F of tau, it's a one form, so locally can be written as a derivative of, of a function F. And this so f depends on which coordinates? Or, um? It's a function, it depends on, on, on t. On, on tau. On tau. Tau. On tau. tau. Yeah, exactly, because it's, it's evaluated at infinity. Okay, so in order to, to show how this works, I will present an example. Uh, an example of SL2R cross U1. The SL2R part of the group contains the gravity degrees of freedom, and the U1 part contains the information about the gauge field. It's an abelian gauge field because it's only U1 symmetry. So I'm going to suppose that A of A infinity, the profile of the gauge field at infinity, is given in terms of two quantities, M and T. In principle, these functions are allowed to fluctuate at infinity. In fact, M transform as a Virasoro stress energy tensor and T transform as a, as a current using the integrability as I just presented I get this expression that the first part the part in blue it's the uh, transformation law the final transformation law of a stress energy tensor M in terms of Diffeomorphism associated to this function f. This is the first part. The second part it's associated to the volume drive. It's the transformation load due to this to the gauge symmetries I have in the, in the gauge field. What is interesting is that the Casimir function acquires the form of a warp conformal stress energy tensor. But now I need to recall another ingredient is that I'm in a black hole, so the holonomies have to be, the, the solution has to be regular. And this imposes certain value for M and P. So it's a fixed value given by those two things. Imposing that, I can find an, an effective Lagrangian at infinity, which is first, the, the first part is the SYT model. Show you the introduction, and the second piece corresponds to uh, well, a free a free particle described by another degree of freedom of six. So, this model we pass from having Virasoro cross Kagmudi U1 symmetry to just SL2R cross U1 symmetry. So, in that sense, the symmetry is cross free. And also, this model appears in the presence. When, when, I, when we study presence, sorry, the SYT model in presence of a, an, integra, an inter, internal global symmetry, which is like the bosonic part of n equals two super, super SYT models. 
which was found by this project. Okay. So this is one example. I have more, but for the time I will stop here. And the conclusions of my talk is that pivot and gravity models successfully reproduce the breaking of asymptotic symmetry groups. The boundary action is controlled by the Casimir function. The Casimir function transforms as a threat any intensity at the boundary. The corresponding action matches with the effective action observing the SYK model. Is there any sense, in, so there's a natural stress energy, well, there's a natural conformal symmetry if you write the doton gravity, if you write the theory in conformal gauge. Is there any sense in which your stress energy tensor generates those conformal transformations in the bulk of ADS2? Yeah, exactly. So these two functions that I, I was telling you about, this M and P, does transform us as, as a stress energy tensor in the bulk, M and P. M and P. Yeah, they, yeah. But how do we, ident we identify, can we identify those with conformal transformations? Yeah, because... With the metric is fixed to conformal gauge? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I, don't, I, don't know. I mean, there's a well-known, you know, Kinnishnik and uh, Podkov and Grimlock. I think that was like David. Anyway, a long time ago, shown that could two-dimensional quantum gravity is equivalent to a conformal field theory. Mm -hmm. With conformal transformations, the conformal symmetry being the um, uh, the residual diffeomorphism invariance when you choose conformal gauge yeah, exactly. for the metric. Here yeah, I'm not using exactly the conformal gauge to represent the, the metric or the gauge field, let's say. Right. So the appearance of a conformal symmetry in two-dimensional gravity, something that's been discussed for yeah, exactly. 30 years. Does this conformal symmetry have any concrete connection with that one? It would be amazing uh, if I they were if, different. I think, I think they, they have a connection, yeah, yeah. But nobody's worked it out. No, I think someone has it. I don't know the details of it. Just a general qualitative question. So you did 2D, mm -hmm. because it's easier, the algebra is good, etc. But do we expect that anything you get in 2D should translate, at least in terms of its qualitative results, to other dimensions? Or do we expect change of dimension to completely change the story? I think the problem is already involved in two dimensions, and I, or in lower dimensions, it's already difficult to, to make sense of a quantum black hole. So it would be nice to extrapolate those results to higher dimensions, but I think we're in a much problematic situation where I think even in lower dimensions, it's difficult to make sense of this. I guess my question is, is it just that it's harder to calculate, yeah, it's, or it's, it's hard. is it that you expect totally new phenomena to show up? I, I think it's much harder, so people haven't tried. Okay, so so you don't know. Don't yeah. Know. Okay. <laughs> but this enhancement of symmetry is expected to be a general hmm. feature of any space-time dimension, right. so I don't understand that very well. In this context, I think that the feature is more applies to higher dimension mm -hmm. space time. Yeah. I guess you want to, you said it, it reduced the bosonic part of the N over 2, so I guess yeah. you, you want the full fermionic. Uh, yeah, yeah, that can yeah. also be obtained by, by extending to another group, the supergroup. You know. Yeah, the supergroup, you yeah. expect to recover the yeah, full N the over 2. Okay, well, let's end our speaker today. Yeah, we have pizza at 4 30. And at 3 we have the, the LIGO sites. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm.
We have a three, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Thank you.